or that you can do it in an awake patient, which allows you to know instantly if they have any neurologic changes and you can reverse whatever you have just done. If they have a neurologic change, you know, you take the weight off or whatever. Um, and that basically is never possible in the operating room under anesthesia. There's always going to be a delay and you're never going to quite know what you're doing to the patient. It can also be done faster than, you know, going to the operating room. You just have to bring your materials and set up in the, in the ICU room that the patient is in. Um, and you can almost instantly decompress the cord and allow for later, less urgent surgical stabilization. Um, but there are risks, of course, as well as important contraindications. And also understanding the mechanisms of injury can be um, helpful in reducing the fracture because you'll be able to understand what needs to occur anatomically to reestablish alignment. Now, there is a debate about getting an MRI before versus after traction. Um, there's a small but real risk of displacing or dragging disc material posteriorly into the spinal canal with any method of reduction, possibly causing neurological compromise. Um, an MRI before traction can alert you to that possibility and might possibly cause you to just go straight to surgery instead. Um, but there's also a likelihood that the actual traction reduction itself can create a new disc herniation um, as you drag the bone back with the traction. And so um, you wouldn't necessarily know that if you got it the MRI beforehand, um, and it's not necessarily reasonable to get an MRI before and after traction. So in my practice, I tend to get the MRI after traction, not before, um, because the patient exam in my mind is better than the MRI before traction. And here's a brief list of tips and protocols for um, cervical traction of another good textbook. And so we'll just go through each um, thing briefly to explain it. So first you wanna rule out skull fractures. Um, that's because you don't wanna put the pins directly into the brain. So that's, that's important. Um, and then, you know, particularly for a halo, the second one is mainly for a halo, but you wanna always place the pins with the eyes closed because you put them just lateral to, to the eyes. And if the patient's eyes are open, you can pin the eyes open and that's, that's suboptimal. Um, Again, closed reduction is contraindicated if you get an MRI before traction and you see a big disc herniation. I usually use the exam for that. Um, and then occasionally, depending on the type of fracture, you either want to pull the patient in axial traction and flexion or axial traction and extension. And so that you actually do that um, relevant to the external auditory meatus. So if you want to um, do traction and extension, you're going to put it a little bit anterior to the external auditory meatus so that they lift their chin up. Um, if you want to put an extension, um, you're going to put it a little bit behind um, the extra auditory meatus to put the chin down. And then when you're starting the weight, you start with a very low weight um, and you obtain an initial x-ray. And that initial x-ray is making sure that you don't have any atlanto-occipital dislocation or anything like that. Um, and then you increase your weight. Um, for each weight increase, you check an x-ray. So when you're a resident, um, you wanna have the x-ray machine in the room. You don't just want lateral films. You want the x-ray machine right there so they can take repeated x-rays um, for each weight increase. Um, and then once the uh, reduction is achieved, you generally will leave the patient in traction um, until uh, definitive uh, treatment is done. And that's usually gonna be, um, be surgery. Um, and then you wanna stop your reduction if you, if you reduce it. Um, you want to stop it if you get um, distraction of the atlanto um, cervi or the occipital cervical junction, um, or if any disc height, disc height is greater than 10 millimeters, that's over distraction, or if you have any neurological changes. It would be unusual to have SSCPs or ME MEPs during um, uh, you know, closed reduction in an awake patient. Maybe some centers do it, um, but you can just follow the exam for those patients. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.